prayer book. And of course, we needed publishers out there in the print the prayer book. So there were publishers in Philadelphia, publishers in New York, publishers in Boston, these places that would, would, would print the prayer book. But there had to be some sort of certification so that you would know that the guy who was printing the prayer book in Boston was printing the same book as the guy who was printing the book in Philadelphia, and the same one was printing the book in, ba in Baltimore. And so the church uh, uh, appointed, uh, not always a bishop, but usually um, someone to be the custodian of the prayer book to say, yes, this thing that is being printed in Philadelphia is the same book that's being printed in New York, is the same book that's being printed in Boston and whatever. Um, and... Um, of course, now the church has its own publishing house and whatever, but there's still duties and things related to, you know, is, does this conform to what the church has actually decided or is somebody trying to, you know. And, of course, you know, the interesting thing about this, just a little aside, in, in Anglican prayer book history, and this would be history we share with you, of course, and that is, um, you know, there, there are any number of, of um, times in, in the prayer book of the Church of England where you know, what's effectively the, the Synod approved a prayer book. It went to Parliament. Parliament approved the prayer book. And then when it got printed, it was different. Uh, and, and so, and, and sometimes, um, you know, they were able to say, well, that's, that, that wasn't what we said, but that's what we meant. But in other cases, it was we not only did not say that, we did not mean that, and we are angry about this change. Uh, and so uh, when, when we came over to this side of the Atlantic, uh, we thought, well, maybe we ought to have somebody watch this, you know. And so, so I'm, I'm the current watchman of the prayer book is basically what that is. Okay, well, it's wonderful uh, to see. And, and my topic, yeah, living a Paschal pattern shaped by... And if, if, you, if you can get your hands on a, 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 a prayer book, a, a book of alternative services, um, we're going to... Um, and pass some to the folks on the front row. We're going to look, uh, you're not going to need it just for a few minutes, but I want you to have it warmed up and handy, okay? Um, and so forth. <clears throat> um, yeah, when, when, when the dean asked me to speak tonight, I thought, well, it'd be kind of fun to, uh, to think a little bit about the prayers of Great Easter. Uh, and, you know, uh, this weekend, we, I mean, we go through these three holy days that begins tonight. And as you know, as, as the Book of Alternative Services and prayer books through most of the Anglican Communion frame these days, um, we start a liturgy this evening that goes through the liturgy on Sunday. In other words, this is not Thursday's liturgy, Friday's liturgy, Saturday's liturgy, Sunday's liturgy. It's one liturgy. It's the Easter liturgy of the church that starts tonight and then has certain stages until it comes to a grand climax Oh, I don't know, quarter of 11, quarter of 12 on, on Sunday morning or whatever. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's one, one large uh, piece, you know, and it's sort of like, okay, we're going to start tonight, but then uh, this liturgy is too long, so, so we're all going to go home and have a little nourishment, take a nap, get some rest, come back and do a little bit more of it tomorrow, and again, have another nap and another rest, you know, a little nourishment, not too much, it's fast days, you know, for a little bit of this, uh, but, but a little nourishment, you know, and then we finally make our way to, to Easter. So it's really helpful to think about this as, as one long um, piece that, that, uh, that starts tonight and, and carries on through, through Sunday. But then Sunday, you know, is not, not over. Uh, I, I am um, not going to do my speech on the Advent police, but, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of a little irritated when I look at my friends and neighbors in my neighborhood that put their Christmas tree up in, at Halloween. Um, <clears throat> and then by noon on Christmas Day, it's out by the curb. You know, and I thought, well, cr Christmas just got started this morning, and it goes for 12 days. Well, we have the same problem in a sense at Easter. We've had 40 days of preparation uh, of, of reflection and prayer and instruction and thoughtfulness and various other kinds of things to lead us through uh, a Lenten uh, discipline uh, with the two sort of poles of, of Lent, you know, penitence on one side and baptismal renewal on the other, the two sort of uh, goalposts that we live between during Lent. 
Um, and, and, we, and we go, and then we, sometimes we, we just we, we crash our way to, um, to, to Easter, and then uh, Easter Day, and then it somehow, well, now that Easter's over. No, 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 no. Easter's not over. Easter is just beginning. I used, to, it used to, I used to get the strangest look when I was a diocesan bishop, uh, you know, like on the third or fourth Sunday of Easter, like a month away. You know? I would go you know, be at the back door of the church, and people would be coming out, and I'd say, Happy Easter! And they'd look at me like, what kind of clown is this? You know, I mean, Easter was weeks ago. No, today is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. It, you know, there's a wonderful phrase that they used in the early church. One of the writers of the early church used to use in describing the 50 days of Easter. He called it, it was the season of unbridled rejoicing. Now, that kind of suggests that, can't, that, that Christians for the rest of the year were kind of when they rejoiced, they had bridles on, <laughs> uh, which is testimony to the fact that there were Anglicans in the early church. <laughs> you know, well, you know, uh, you know. I mean, well, you know, there. I mean, come on, people. There are two kinds of Christians: there are microwave Christians and there are crockpot Christians. <laughs> and and Anglicans, by and large, are crockpot Christians. You know, I mean, you know, we don't do anything in a hurry. We never get really hot. Right? And we can be, and, and, and like a lot of things you cook in the microwave, if you're not careful, it can be dry in the center. Right? I mean, it pretty much describes us, right? But, but, but crockpot Christians, no, no, that's the slow simmer, the gentle simmer, the long term formation. We say these prayers day in and day out, year after year for a lifetime. And it makes this really rich, thick kind of gravy that we kind of wallow in. You know? I mean, that's much more us than microwave. You know? Well, okay. So, so where is this going? This is going somewhere, I promise. Okay. So we have 50 days. Now, um, uh, th think about this for a minute. Uh, 50 days is a week of weeks plus one day. Right? And, and, uh, and, and, and there's an interesting parallel there because when you have a week, you have seven days, and then at the seventh day, one, one of the things that, that, that the, that the uh, ancient writers of the church used to talk about was the, the, seventh, the, the, the first day of the week is actually the seventh day of the previous week. And so, and, and so the first day or the first day and the eighth day always overlap. And so, you know, Sunday is, Sunday is sort of the day in which two weeks meet, you know, in which two realities strike together uh, and so forth. Well, you have a not dissimilar thing than when, when you have a, an Easter thing. Seven, seven times seven is 49 plus one is 50. Okay, now why, why is 50 important? Well, the, you know, in, in, in the Bible where you've got, you know, the year of Jubilee, every 50 years is a particular kind of day when things are let loose and people are set free and prisoners are released and whatever. So, there, I mean, there are all these parallels that are operating in this. Now, when, if I were to ask you, and you'll all know the answer to this, when it's Pentecost, you'll say, well, it's, it's, the, it's the, you know, Sunday where everybody wears red. We might have a balloon launch after church or something, um, you know, and, um, and, and, and it's the 50th day of Easter, right? Pente, five. So it's a 50, you know, okay. But, 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 you know, actually, if you look carefully at the liturgical materials, you know, when people get into June and July and August, they'll say, well, this is the 14th Sunday of Pentecost. No, it's not. Because Pentecost ended on the 50th, 50th day of Easter. The Pentecost of the church is the 50 days of Easter. I mean, if you look at the documents of the, of the church, it, it, I mean, the ones that are carefully done, uh, at least, um, you'll say, you know, um, I mean, we could say instead of the first Sunday of Easter, the second Sunday of Easter, the third Sunday of Easter, we could say the first Sunday of the Pentecost, the second Sunday of the Pentecost, the third Sunday of the Pentecost, in other words, the first Sunday of the 50, the second Sunday of the 50, the third Sunday of the 50, the fourth Sunday of the 50, right? Um, oh, by the way, let me tell you all a really cute one. This kind of stuff keeps me up at night. Uh, so those of you who remember old prayer books, 
Well, remember, and I don't mean just the, the 1962 Canadian book. I'm talking about old ones, okay? Um, the, 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 the day of Pentecost um, will, will sometimes be referred to as Whitson Day or Whit Sunday, depending on where you're from, you know? Um, uh, uh, you know, okay, and, and, uh, and, and one of the, one of the great uh, curiosities is where does that come from? Well, uh, there, there are those who say, well, it's, it's really, it's just a, 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 a elision somehow of White Sunday because that was the Sunday the bishop came for confirmation and everybody wears white for confirmation, so it's White Sunday. Now, everybody knows that Pentecost is red, so it can't be White Sunday because Pentecost is red. Pentecost has always been red since the 13th century. So it can't be White Sunday even if all the girls have on white dresses. I mean, no, no. So that, that goes away. Um, for a long time, the gospel on that day was one of those passages in the gospel of Matthew where the disciples finally got their wits about them. And a number of scholars for a period of time, so we call that Whitson Day because that's the gospel in which the disciples finally got their wits about them. Man, that's a hard sell on Main Street. <laughs> that's a really hard sell on Main Street. Okay, let me, but let me give you just another, and, and the, what I'm about to tell, the explanation I'm about to give you is probably just as silly as those two, but, it's, but at least it's the kind of thing you win Jeopardy with. Okay, um, there's a fella by the name of Hammond Lestrange. And Hammond Lestrange um, uh, lived in the late 1600s. And he was a layman from a very prominent English family. Uh, had a fabulous education, uh, but, but was not ordained, was a layperson. But he wrote the first commentary on the Book of Common Prayer. And he decided when he got to this point that he had to explain why Whitsunday, what, what that meant. Well, he scratched his head and thought about it and did a little homework and whatever. And he said, you know... Um, just across the channel over there in France, uh, the eighth Sunday of Easter is Wittiem Dimanche. And if you bring the French into the English, it becomes Whitsunday. In other words, what Whitsunday means is the eighth Sunday. It's, a, it's an, Anglica, Anglican, an Anglicanization of the French Wittiem Dimanche. You know, yeah, you know, again, that's the kind of thing you win Jeopardy with. Um, but it makes at least as much sense as the other ones I was giving you. Okay, so we have 50 days of, of unbridled rejoicing. Okay, so 40 days of Easter, 50 days of unbridled rejoicing, that is 90 days. 90 times 4 is 36. So you add a zero, that's 360 days, which is the number of full weeks you have in a lunar calendar, uh, which means it basically is a quarter of the year. Our Lent and Easter season together is a quarter of the year, which is the largest single chunk, especially of a festal season, uh, that we have uh, available to us. Of course, you know, you calendar people out there are going to go, yes, but that's a lunar calendar. A solar calendar is 365 and one quarter days a year, so you're missing four and a quarter days, and you're right. Uh, um, I am missing a quarter, <laughs> four and a quarter days, five and a quarter days. Okay, now let's talk about um, this little next little piece. And, and, and uh, so, okay, so we got the 50 days of uh, unbridled rejoicing. Okay, now let's talk about Pascha for a minute. We talk about the Paschal Vigil, we talk about the Paschal Candle, we talk about the Paschal Mystery, we talk about um, uh, the Paschal pattern of life, which I'm going to get to here in a minute. Okay, and so where does that word come from, Pascha? Okay, well, obviously it comes through a variety of languages, and, and, and you know, as people who speak English, um, you know, we, we have, um, uh, we, we, we've chosen the word Easter, which is an old Anglo-Saxon kind of uh, uh, word, but most, uh, most modern, even modern languages use some variation on Pascha, Pasqueta, I mean, there, you know, or some, some, uh, some variation on, on, on that. And so where does that come from? Well, it has an interesting derivation that, that continues to trip scholars up. It's, it's amazing when you uh, read about this stuff, which is what I do late at night when I can't sleep. Um, you, you know, 
which you, you read about this stuff, and, and there are still people who think it comes from the Greek. Well, it's not unreasonable to think it comes from the Greek because the Greek word that kind of sounds like it is poskane. And poskane means to suffer. So if this is about the suffering of Christ and the passion of Christ and whatever, then why wouldn't the Greek root of poskane, you know, be an interesting way that we got, hit, got there? Well, I mean, and there's certainly some overlap, right, in the meaning frame, frameworks, Okay. Well, the problem with that is it's wrong um, because it actually comes from the Hebrew word Pesach, which means Passover, which is what our sisters and brothers in the Hebrew and the Jewish tradition are celebrating these days. As we, and, and as you know, um, while they, they figure the lunar calendar and we, you know, we figure the date of Easter on the basis of a lunar calendar, they figured the date of Passover on a lunar calendar, but the rubrics are just a little different. So they'll always be in relationship to each other, but they always won't necessarily overlap. But as you know, we used to say, well, you know, whenever the Jews have Passover, whenever we have Easter, we can see each other from there. <laughs> you know, because we're, I mean, it's going to be somewhere relatively close. It's just a different interpretation of the lunar cycle. Okay? So now. So we, um, we have the, so Pesach, Passover. So what is Easter for us? Easter is our Passover. This is the time when we celebrate, and remember and celebrate the Passover of Jesus out of death into life. The, you know, when, when the, uh, the Paschal Lamb, you know, in the, in the Passover story, Passover, Paschal Lamb, that, that whole part of the, 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 the biblical narrative that, that, that the Jews celebrate on Passover and their, their freedom uh, and from, from uh, uh, Egypt. And, I mean, you know the Passover story. Um, and, and, and then, and for our case, it's the, the Passover of Jesus from death to life. What does that result for us? Just as, just as the Passover story results in freedom for the Jews, what is it, reason, what is it for us? Um, uh, freedom. Uh, uh, redemption, liberation, okay? And so it, it's, a, it's a, both pieces going, um, going at once. And so, so this is our Passover. Now, let's just look at the text. Um, if you'll look with me in the BAS um, on page, uh, well, turn to 322. Uh, the introduction to the service of light. Uh, the presider, the bishop or the dean, or I don't know who it'll be, but some, somebody will read this on Saturday night. Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night when our Lord Jesus Christ passed from death, to, passed over from death to life. The church invites her children throughout the world to come together in vigil and prayer. This is the Passover of the Lord. We remember his death and resurrection. By hearing his word and celebrating his mysteries, we are confident that we shall share the victory over death and live with him forever in God. So, I mean, we, right out of the gate, we name the principal feast of Easter as our Passover. And that is the fundamental. Okay, now if you flip the page, the next page to uh, 323 has the beginning of the exalted, rejoice now heavenly choirs of angels. And that, that prayer, you know, just so you know that they didn't make this up in Toronto a few years ago, uh, this uh, particular uh, prayer has been around since the middle of the 4th century. Actually, there are parts of it that, that are in from the 3rd century. But the, the, you know, and, and the version that you have in the BAS and frankly the version in most modern Anglican prayer books is a severely shortened form. Uh, the, the Exalted actually goes on for several more pages if you use the full text. And one of the uh, most difficult things that the framers of books like this have to do is decide, okay, uh, the good faithful people, even of Christ Church Cathedral Vancouver, are probably not going to sit through the whole Exalted, so which verses of the Exalted are we going to give them? And so what you have in this book is the last time that was decision was made, and I am here to predict the prophet in me wants to say that when the Anglican Church of Canada revises the vigil liturgy, one of the things that will have to be dealt with again is the length of the exaltet. Whether it'll be shortened more, whether it'll be lengthened, and if it's lengthened, what will be added back? Okay, it's not that they're going to write anything new, 
they're just going to, you know. Um. Anyway, one, one of the things that's missing from this one, and it's, I, I must say it's also missing from the prayer book in the, in the States, is in the original Exalted has this wonderful section where we give thanks for the bees who gave their wax so that we could have these candles to have the light of the world to celebrate the da 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 I mean, I mean it's just it's extraordinary. Okay, m moving on to page three. Oh, well, good, good. I'm glad we'll have some bees. Okay, now if you look at the top of page 324, how am I doing here? Okay, we're good. Um, this is the, uh, the continuing text of the of the exalted, this is our Passover feast. When Christ, the true lamb, remember the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, Hebrews, I mean in the Exodus story, uh, the Passover story that our, our Jewish sisters and brothers will, will be remembering these days. The true uh, lamb is, is slain whose blood consecrates the homes. Remember the, the, the blood on the lentil posts in the Passover story? Well, their blood consecrates the homes of all of our believers, okay? So there's a direct relationship that this is the night. When you first saved our forebears, you freed the people of Israel. In other words, there's our continuity with our Jewish brothers and sisters. You know, we are all daughters and sons of Sarah and Abraham. Um, uh, uh, people of Israel from their slavery and led them dry shod. That's one of the greatest phrases in all of Christian literature, dry shod. I mean, you know, we went through there on dry ground. Okay, this is the night when Christians everywhere washed clean of sin and freed from all defilement. Are re now, now, notice what's going on. Did, remember five minutes ago I said there are two poles to Lent? One is repentance and penitence. The other is baptismal preparation. Well, I, I didn't make that up. Right here it is. Wash clean from sin. That's one side. Freed from all defilement and restored to grace. That's the repentance side. So both of those poles, whether you've been walking to the, to, whether you're walking to the font for baptism at Easter, or whether you're walking to the font at Easter for renewal, either way, we're all walking together, and we do it this night. This is the night when Christ broke the chains of death and rose triumphant from the grave. Um, the power of this night dispels all evil, washes guilt away, restores lost innocence, brings mourners to joy. Night truly blessed when heaven is wedded to earth. Da 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 da. da. Okay, so my, my 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 point is, you you. I mean, we will be singing this this you know praise to the Paschal candle, our great Passover symbol, as a Passover people, as we celebrate the central story of our redemption, which is the Passover of God in Christ out of death into life. You know, and so, so what does Pascha mean? Passover. It is our Passover, you know. Um, and, uh, um, and there's only somebody said, well, how is Easter different from Passover? Well, one is spelled with an E. The other is, it's the same thing, okay? Um, it is just, it is our embrace of it um, as, um, as Christians. Uh, look over on um, 327. I want to, uh, we're, we're going to talk about several of these prayers here in a minute, but I, before I forget it, I want to really uh, 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 underscore something. On page 327, the first prayer on the top, um, this, this prayer at the top answers a question, and the question that it answers is, who are the people of God? And it's interesting that the answer to that question for our Jewish sisters and brothers and for us is the same. O oh God, you led your ancient people by a pillar of cloud by night and a pillar of fire by day. Now, um, a pillar of fire rep is represented ritually among us during the great 50 days of Easter and at, ba and at uh, uh, baptisms and funerals by the Paschal candle, a pillar of fire, you know, because it, it, it defines us. Uh, they say, you know, those who are, who are born, and, and, and we, 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 we use the Paschal candle at a baptism, right? Because it is what is Easter candle. It reminds us that these people who are being baptized are going to pass over out of death into life. They're going from 
life to death to life again in the sacrament of holy baptism. And, you know, uh, it, why, why do we pull out the Paschal candle and put it by the, ca- the, the coffin at a funeral or by the, the, the uh, cremated remains at a funeral or, you know, whatever it is, whatever mortal uh, business we have left <laughs> at that point? Why do we put the Paschal candle there? To remind the family, but to remind us that this person that we are commending to God was numbered among the people of God because they had passed over out of death into life in the waters of holy baptism. Okay? Um, and so, and then a pillar, of, uh, fire, uh, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day is represented by the incense. You know, so, so you know, and, and of course, you know, um, incense in its normal kind of frames are, you know, the, the, one of the interesting things about incense is, is, is the smoke will, will all, if it's real incense, the smoke will go up. It's kind of like a, like a, like almost like a, a, a flag or a torch or a, you know, and so like, oh, those people over there, the ones where you see the smoke and the ones where you see the pillar of fire, those are the people of God. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You know, and, and, and we are the ones who follow that way so that uh, we may come to the joy of that heavenly Jerusalem where we wipe away all tears and where your saints sing your praise forever and ever and ever. And so, but I, I've always loved that, that prayer because it's, it, I mean, as I say, it's, it's the prayer that, so that reminds, you know, who are we? You know, well, like the, those who have gone before us, generation after generation, century after century, we are the ones, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. You know, and, and, and what does that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire represent? That we are people of the Passover. That we are the ones who have passed with Christ out of death into life. Okay? And, uh, and okay, so let's keep moving here. Um, I don't want to get in trouble with the dean. Um, okay, past, okay, the next thing I want to mention, um, uh, it, we, an, another phrase that I've used a couple of times, but I want to just unpack it a little bit is uh, we, we often use a term, particularly in, in theological uh, frameworks, uh, we'll talk about the paschal mystery. The paschal mystery. Now, translated, that would be the, what is the Passover mystery? Would be another way to ask the question. But the paschal mystery in, in, uh, in, in, in sort of the theological tradition, the Christian theological tradition, um, is, 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 is very simply the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and so when I say to a group of students, um, today we are going to talk about the relationship between the Paschal mystery and the Eucharist, what we're talking about ultimately then is the death and resurrection of Jesus and how that is lived out and, and how we are empowered to live and walk that life and experience that life and deepen that life through participation in the Holy Eucharist. Or on another day, I might say, today we're going to talk about the Paschal Mystery and Baptism, which would be a topic about how is it that we enter by water in the Holy Spirit into the Paschal life of Jesus, into the Passover of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and what is that journey about? And, you know, the Passover assumes movement, Right? I mean, it's not, you know, you, don't, you can't pass over and stand still. You got to move from death to life. You got to move from Egypt to the promised land. I mean, it, it, the very notion of Passover, if you follow a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, suggests you're going somewhere, right? Okay? And so that going somewhere is, is, the, is uh, the movement that's implied here is, is really... Uh, very powerful and very important. So, okay, so what we, we talk, we're talking about is the, you know, and, and so the, the question of discipleship, you know, what does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? I think what it means, and there are many definitions, and this is not the only one, there, you know, everybody's got their own definition. My definition of what it means to be a disciple is to get up every morning and try to figure out how I can live more deeply and more passionately and more clearly and more transparently into the Paschal mystery of my Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, how can I share more clearly with him in his death? And how can I live more clearly with him 
in the power of His resurrection. And that, my friends, is what gave this talk tonight the title, The Paschal Pattern. Um, I, I think that now, now there are all kinds of things attached to discipleship. What are we doing to uh, relieve the suffering of other people? What are we doing to build up the body of Christ? What are we doing to bring people who have not heard of Christ uh, to a saving knowledge of, uh, of, of, of Him? Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, discipleship can mean a thousand different things. But it always starts, it seems to me, with each one of us emerging from the womb of the church which is the old, centuries-old, classical, you know, if, if we talk of Mother Church, her precious womb. We all are born from the church's precious womb. Okay, so, so we, 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 we are born, and we, 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 how, how do we enter ever more deeply into the death and resurrection of Jesus. You know, Martin Luther had a, uh, when he was writing the catechism in seven, uh, 15, 17, geez, uh, Neil, please, uh, in 1526 or 7, um, uh, one, of, one of the things uh, he, he, he talked about there, uh, he doesn't use the phrase Paschal pattern, but that, well, first of all, you can't say that in German. Um, um, well, you can, it's Mysterian Gegenwart, but you know, that, that's really hard for a bunch of 12-year-olds. Um, um, anyway, but, but, but basically, he, he, he talks about this, this pattern, and, and, and uh, he, he, had a, he had a wonderful, wonderful phrase for it, or a description of it. He said, um, at the end of your day, you should stop and pray, offer to God everything that's happened that day, your sins, but also the good things that have happened, your gratitude for the good things that have happened, offer to God your joy for the things that are, that are, uh, that are, are gifts and, 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 and whatever. And he said, and then go quickly to sleep before you sin again. <laughs> In other words, Luther did not know insomnia, but that's probably because of all the Wittenberg beer he had been drinking, but nonetheless... <laughs> But then he, but, but then he said, he, on the other side, he said, but you get up in the morning and you splash cold water on your face and you remind yourself that you are baptized and that you've been given another day to walk in the power of the resurrection, to live a risen life. And so, he, and, and, but basically, what though is it's catechism, right? It was basic discipleship training. So he's trying to say, you know, you, every day we die to sin. Every day we confess it, we let it go, we entrust it to God, we recognize we're not perfect, we know we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. We're, you know, I mean, you know, we, we have to let it go. But then we rise up the next day in the power of the resurrection. And we've been given a new day to walk in resurrection, a new day to, to, to claim the power of what it means to be a risen child of God that has come forth from the womb in the power of the resurrection. So, so basically what I was talking about is a day in and day out. You die to sin. Now, he didn't make that up. Who made that up? Well, I'm not sure, but St. Paul certainly knew about it. The sixth chapter, of, sixth chapter of the book of Romans. If you haven't got that memorized, tonight would be a good time to start. <laughs> Go home, pull out your Bibles, chapter 6. Uh, it's one of those parts of the Bible uh, that every person should you know, have. If, 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 if not, it, not the text memorized, at least the gist of the story <laughs> you know, in Romans 6. But, but also, don't forget about Romans 12, but we'll get to that later. Okay, but Romans, Romans 6 where Paul says, you know, we die with Christ in baptism. We are buried with Christ in baptism. When we enter the water, it is though we are entering the grave. We die with Christ, but then we rise. We, we emerge from the water. We're born out of the water. We're born anew. We're born from above. We're born again for God's sake. Right? Why well, we got to... We've got to be born. Um, anyway, so, but that, that's St. Paul, you know. We die with Christ 
in baptism. In the waters of baptism, we die. And in the waters of baptism, we are risen to new life. Well, that's the Paschal pattern. Day in and day out. Day in. We, we let it go, and then we take it up again. We lay it down, and we take it up again. We lay it down, and we pick it up again. You know, and, and um, you know, it's not like um, in Christian life um, we, we sort of get stuck in one of those. You know, well, I mean, I, I think sometimes maybe we feel like we've gotten stuck. We've either gotten stuck in the die to sin part, and we can't believe that, 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 that God is calling us to this deeper and more powerful relationship in the power of the resurrection. Or we get, in some ways, stuck on the other side of that and forget that we are sinners saved by grace, you know. Um, yeah, I, I remember, uh, I don't know why this came to mind. This was not in my notes. But um, uh, I don't know whether years, there are no, no number of you, are, not everybody here, but a number of you are old enough to remember a fellow by the name of Thomas Harris. Thomas was a, a psychiatrist in California back in the early, late 1960s, early 1970s, and he wrote a book called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Remember that? And I'll never forget the time I went to an Easter uh, or Good, Good Friday service. It was a Good Friday service at, at uh, this church, and, and the, uh, um, I was in the choir, and the, uh, the preacher that day was some visiting person <laughs> from somewhere else. Um, and, and, uh, but, but, I, but, but, but Thomas Harrison, I'm okay, you're okay, was like, you know, selling more copies than any other book during those days. And the preacher said, I'll never forget it. He said, the problem with, uh, with I'm okay, you're okay is that it may make some sense psychologically, but it has missed the point of the gospel. Because the point of the gospel is that I am not okay, and that you are not okay, but that's okay. And, 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 and that distinction is really important. That we die to sin and rise to new life day in and day out, day in and day out. Okay, now... This is about the prayers of Easter. So let us, let me, um, how much time have I got? Uh, okay, just may, maybe three or four more minutes, is that right? Something like that? Okay, uh, all right, so now let's look next at the bottom of page 328. <clears throat> We're going to go backwards here. One, the, the prayer at the bottom of 328 is one of the prayers that, uh, um, uh, it, 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 I think it, it's particularly close to the hearts of our bishops um, because it's one of the ones that gets used uh, so many of Episcopal services. This is the, one of the prayers. Um, and so it's, you know, after you've been a bishop about 20 minutes, this one's memorized. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's, but, but it, it embodies this notion of Paschal pattern. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility to the plan of salvation. And here it comes. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, that, I mean it's, that, it's almost that rhythm. It's, I mean, it's, you know, things which were cast down are being raised up. Things which had grown old are being made new. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the Paschal rhythm. That's the, that's the rhythm of Easter, you know? I mean, you can almost imagine the Paschal candle coming down the aisle. Things which were cast down are being raised up. Things which, I, mean, it's, it's, that's, I mean, it's the rhythm of the Paschal pattern. Okay, now look at the top of that page. Almighty and everlasting God, in the what? The Paschal mystery you established. In other words, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, there is a new covenant of reconciliation. That's what that means. Okay? Um, grant that all who are born again, ha, huh? that those who have you know, we've talked about born again here already, right? But those who are born again in baptism those who have died to sin, been buried with Christ, and have been raised with Christ in baptism to new life, those who have been born again in baptism may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Grant this, da 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 Notice the next prayer. Living God by the Passover of your Son. 
by that movement through death and out through resurrection. You have brought us out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. There are those patterns again. Sin, righteousness, death, life. That's the Paschal pattern. It's just everywhere. It's in the hymns. It's in the text. It's in the Bible. It's in the prayer book. Well, of course it's in the Bible. You know the story of the uh, uh, um, gentleman who came out of a church in an Anglican church one Sunday. Uh, was, the priest was back at the door, and this is an old conjurer who had been an uh, Episcopalian or an Anglican all his life, and he's going out the back door, and he puts his arm on the shoulder of the rector and says, you know, I just never cease to be amazed at how often the Scriptures quote the prayer book. <laughs> it's actually the other way around. <laughs> okay, uh, moving, moving back... Um, uh, to page 327. I mean, this all hangs together. Creator of the universe, source of all light, teach us to hold fast to the ways of wisdom that we may live forever in the radiance of your glory. That's a light reference to the light of Easter and, and to uh, the, the you know, pillar of fire. Okay? Um, I mean, and, we, and, and, and notice... Um, uh, oh God, by the power of your word, you have created all things. That's what we talked about the other day. You had to speech things into existence. And by your spirit, you renew the earth. Give now the water of life to those who thirst. That they Again, water of life is a baptismal reference. You know? Uh, I mean, so anyway, we could keep going, going through this. Uh, look over on page 326. God of steadfast love, that's, you know... Um, uh, your wonderful deeds of old shine forth even our own day by the power of your mighty arm you once delivered your chosen people from slavery under Pharaoh to be a sign for us of the salvation of all nations by the water of baptism. In other words, just as you pulled the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt through the desert, through the Red Sea, on dry land and into the promised land, so by the waters of baptism, you pull us through that journey to, from where we are to where you need us to be. Which is, of course, the theme of what the first major story, after you get past the, the sort of theological uh, um, stuff of the first few chapters of Genesis, when you get in the first real story of Genesis, you know, what is it? It's Abraham and Sarah. God goes to Abraham and Sarah, I see where you are there, but I would really like for you to be over here. So you're going to take a journey, and they say, well, we're old, we don't really want to do that. Huh, come on. You know, and I mean, the, I mean, the first major story in Scripture is God going to Abraham and Sarah saying, I know you're enjoying your garden, but we're not going to stay here. We're going to go over here. And Abraham, because he was what the Scripture says, a man of faith, a faithful man, he was, it's very clear he was not happy. And you can only imagine the conversation with him, him and Sarah in the tent that night. But they got up and they followed and went to the place where God... I mean, it's all about movement. The people of God are always on the move. And the, the micro-movement is in and out of the water. And that in and out of the water just keeps, the, the, the picture of that just keeps driving us from one place to another throughout our entire life as we get, get try to be faithful to Jesus. So my hope for you is, um, what I want to encourage you to do is what we've, we've, we've just hit a lick and a promise tonight but a, little, a few of the prayers of Great Easter, and by that I mean the collects and prayers of the Great Paschal Vigil, as that is represented in, in uh, the, the church's Book of Alternative Services. You know, the, as I say, these prayers did not fall from the sky. These, most of these prayers are centuries old. They're in a modern translation. They've been adapted, new language a little bit here. They've taken words that we don't use anymore and try to come up with words that are closer to the way we talk now. I mean, you know, no, no, no text is ever completely static. They're all dynamic and they're all in movement and, uh, and, and, and so forth. But, but, but there's, uh, there's ancient wisdom 
There's ancient faith. There's ancient guidance in each one of these prayers. And so my, my hope is that uh, I, I suspect most of you probably have a BAS at home. Uh, if, if not, you can probably borrow one but it, or, or get, get yourself one or whatever. But I would hope that in your prayer and in your devotion and in your, your contemplation during the great 50 days of Easter, just, you know, five, ten minutes a day, pull down the book, keep it open on your desk to the great vigil of each Easter, and then just go back over these or Passover, pillar of cloud, Pillar of fire, water of life, um, uh, the, uh, the, the one, um, um, I lost my page, um, uh, cast down, raised up, grown old, made new. I mean, keep all of those phrases, all of those words just almost, almost ringing in your ear. Maybe, maybe commit a few of those sentences, a couple of those phrases to, to memory so when you're out walking or walking the dog or going to the supermarket or, you know, just out for a stroll around the neighborhood, that some of those phrases, you know, you know, walk with them in prayer. You know, cast down, raised up. Cast down, raised up. I've been cast down and I've been raised up. Hallelujah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 one of the great glories of our tradition as Anglicans is, is that we, over time, commit the prayers of our tradition to our hearts. Um, and, and, and they become a part of us. You know, that doesn't mean we don't pray extemporaneously. It doesn't mean we don't cry out to God in, in, an, uh, in a free-form way when we're also sitting and meditating or whatever. But, you know, we, we, we don't call the prayers of the church the church's school of prayer for nothing. You know, I, I, people say to me, how do I learn to pray? Well, you learn to pray by opening the book and just doing it. And then that, over time, that frees you. That, 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 that makes, and, and it, it begins to shape you in ways that, that then you, you don't need the book. And you can just pray freely and openly and whatever, but it's a great way to kind of learn the vocabulary of faith and to be reminded of things. I mean, I, I need to go back to some of these prayers to be reminded that my identity is wrapped up with those who walk by a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, that's a phrase that I probably wouldn't just pop off in, a, in an extemporaneous prayer. So I need to keep the text around so that I am reminded of who am I? Oh, I'm, I'm a part of that congregation. Oh, yeah, the ones who, who follow the Paschal, Paschal candle or the one who follows the light of resurrection, yeah, the gift of the risen one. All right, that's more than enough for one night, especially since we uh, have to have a little more church here in a minute. So thank you for your attention, and I, I hope that maybe a sentence or two with that was useful in some way or another. And I will uh, look forward to uh, walking these next three holy days um, with you. And here's my promise. If we all hold on, we will get to Easter Day. Thank you.